Oh, hi, hello again. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am that host, that woman who could talk about Greek mythology for the rest of time and find herself perfectly content. Live. It is endlessly wild to me how long I've been doing this and still how much I learn every week between my obsessive research for episodes and my conversations with some super smart and cool people. I'm constantly fascinated, constantly learning, constantly obsessing over new facts and ideas. The ancient world is seriously, seriously incredible, and I would like to know everything about it, please. And on that note, that note of how cool and wonderful the ancient world is, how brilliant and interesting its writers were, shall we dive back into my favorite Roman author? Possibly just my favorite Roman overall? Ovid? His Metamorphoses, one of the most beautiful sources on classical mythology, even if we often don't know what Ovid invented and what he got from Greek sources and that we no longer have. Ovid's Metamorphoses are some of the most cinematic, detailed, beautiful, and so much more mythological retellings. They are so uniquely Ovid. So good. Now, as I mentioned, Ovid is Roman. He comes very late in the wide world of myth, and while he's definitely mostly talking about Greek myths, or at least stories that originate in Greek traditions, he is putting his Roman spin on it. He is making it very Ovidian. Ovid isn't concerned with conveying just the details of the myths. He's interested in looking at transformations, metamorphoses. And so sometimes those are played up or even invented. But fuck if they aren't done so beautifully. That's all to say, Ovid shouldn't be your go-to source for Greek tradition. But it can be your go-to source for fun and beautiful stories featuring these mythological characters. So with that, let's get right back to it. This is Ovid's Metamorphoses, Book 1, translated by Brooks Moore, Part 2. Daphne, the daughter of a river god, was first beloved by Phoebus, the great god of glorious light. It was not a cause of chance, but out of Cupid's vengeful spite, that she was fated to torment the lord of light. For Phoebus, proud of Python's death, beheld that impish god of love upon a time when he was bending his diminished bow, and voicing his contempt in anger, said, What, wanton boy, are mighty arms to thee, great weapons suited to the needs of war? The bow is only for the use of those large deities of heaven, whose strength may deal wounds mortal to the savage beasts of prey, and who courageous overcome their foes. It is a proper weapon to the use of such as slew with arrows python, huge, whose pestilential carcass vast extent covered. Content yourself with the flames your torch enkindles, fires too subtle for my thought, and leave to me the glory that is mine. To him undaunted, Venus's son replied, O oh, Phoebus, that you can't conquer all the world with your strong bow and arrows, but with this small arrow I shall pierce your vaunting breast, and by the measures that you might exceed the broken powers of your defeated foes, so is your glory less than mine. No more, he said, but with his wings expanded thence flew lightly to Parnassus's lofty peak. There, from his quiver, he plucked two arrows, most curiously wrought of different art. One love exciting, one repelling love. The dart of love was glittering, gold and sharp. The other had a blunted tip of lead. And with that dull lead dart, he shot the nymph. But with the keen point of the golden dart, he pierced the bone and marrow of the god. Immediately, the one with love was filled. The other, scowling at the thought of love, rejoiced in the deep shadow of the woods. 
And as the virgin Phoebe, who denies the joys of love, and as the virgin Phoebe, who denies the joys of love and loves the joys of chase, a maiden's fillet bound with her flowing hair and her pure mind denied the love of man. Beloved and wooed, she wandered silent paths, for never could her modesty endure the glance of man or listen to his love. Her grieving father spoke to her. Alas, my daughter, I have wished a son-in-law, and now you owe a grandchild to the joy of my old age. But Daphne only hung her head to hide her shame. The nuptial torch seemed criminal to her. She even clung, caressing with her arms around his neck, and pled, My dearest father, let me live a virgin always, for remember Jove did grant it to Diana at her birth. But though her father promised her desire, her loveliness prevailed against their will. For Phoebus, when he saw her waxed distraught, and filled with wonder, his sick fancy raised delusive hopes, and his own oracles deceived him. As the stubble in the fields flare up, or as the stacked wheat is consumed by flames, enkindled from a spark or torch, the chance pedestrian may neglect at dawn, so was the bosom of the god consumed, and so desire flamed in his stricken heart. He saw her bright hair waving down her neck, how beautiful if properly arranged. He saw her eyes like stars of sparkling fire, her lips for kissing sweetest, and her hands and fingers and her arms, her shoulders white as ivory, and whatever was not seen more beautiful must be. Swift as the wind from his pursuing feet the virgin fled, and neither stopped nor heeded as he called, O nymph, O Daphne, I entreat you stay, it is no enemy that follows you. Why, so the lamb leaps from the raging wolf, and from the lion runs the timid fawn, and from the eagle flies the trembling dove. All hasten from their natural enemy, but I alone pursue for my dear love. Alas, if you should fall and mar your face, or tear upon the bramble your soft thighs, or should I prove unwilling cause of pain— the wilderness is rough and dangerous, and I beseech you, be more careful. I will follow slowly. Ask of whom you will, and you shall learn that I am not a churl. I am no mountain dweller of rude caves, nor clown compelled to watch the sheep and goats, and neither can you know from whom your feet fly fearful, or you would not leave me like this. The Delphic land, the Patarian realm, Claros and Tenedos revere my name, and my immortal father is Jupiter. The present, past, and future are through me in sacred oracles revealed to man, and from my harp the harmonies of sound are borrowed by the bards to praise the gods. My bow is certain, but a flaming shaft surpassing mine has pierced my heart, untouched before. The art of medicine is my invention, and the power of herbs. But though the world declares my useful works, there is no herb to medicate my wound. And all the arts that save have failed their lord. But even as he made his plaint, the nymph with timid footsteps fled from his approach, and left him to his murmurs and his pain. Lovely the virgin seemed, as the soft wind exposed her limbs, and as the zephyrs fawned fluttering amid her garments, and the breeze fanned lightly in her flowing hair. She seemed most lovely to his fancy in her flight, and mad with love he followed in her steps, and silent hastened his increasing speed. As when the greyhound sees the frightened hare flit over the plain, with eager nose outstretched, impetuous, he rushes on his prey, and gains upon her till he treads her feet, and almost fastens in her side his fangs. But she, while dreading that her end is near, is suddenly delivered from her fright. So was it the god and virgin. One with hope pursued, the other fled in fear, and he who followed, born on wings of love, permitted her no rest and gained on her, until his warm breath mingled in her hair. Her strength spent, pale and faint, with pleading eyes she gazed upon her father's waves, and prayed, Help me, my father, if your flowing streams have virtue. 
Cover me, O Mother Earth. Destroy the beauty that has injured me, or change the body that destroys my life. Before her prayer was ended, torpor seized on all her body and a thin bark closed around her gentle bosom, and her hair became as moving leaves. Her arms were changed to waving branches, and her active feet as clinging roots were fastened to the ground. Her face was hidden with encircling leaves. Phoebus admired and loved the graceful tree, for still, though changed, her slender form remained. And with his right hand lingering on the trunk, he felt her bosom throbbing in the bark. He clung to trunk and branch as though to twine his form with hers, and fondly kissed the wood that shrank from every kiss. And thus the god said, Although you can't be my bride, you shall be called my chosen tree, and your green leaves, O oh, laurel, shall forever crown my brows, be wreathed around my quiver and my lyre. The Roman heroes shall be crowned with you, as long processions climb the capital, and chanting throngs proclaim their victories. And as a faithful warden, you shall guard the civic crown of oak leaves, fixed between your branches, and before Augustan gates. And as my youthful head is never shorn, so also shall you ever bear your leaves, unchanging to your glory. Here the god, Phoebus Apollo, ended his lament, and unto him the laurel bent her boughs, so lately fashioned, and it seemed to him her graceful nod gave answer to his love. There is a grove in Thessaly, enclosed on every side with crags precipitous, on which a forest grows, and this is called the Vale of Tempe. Through this valley flows the river Peneus, white with foaming waves that issue from the foot of Pindus, whence with sudden fall gather steamy clouds that sprinkle mist upon the circling trees, and far away with mighty roar resound. It is the abode, the solitary home, that mighty river loves, where deep in gloom of rocky cavern he resides and rules the flowing waves and the water nymphs abiding there. All rivers of that land now hasten there, doubtful to console or flatter Daphne's parent, poplar-crowned Spurchios, swift Enipius, and the wild Amphrysos, old Epidanus and Aias, with all their kindred streams that wandering maze and wearied seek the ocean. Inachus alone is absent, hidden in his cave obscure, deepening his waters with his tears, most wretchedly bewailing, for he deems his daughter, Io, lost. If she may live or roam a spirit in the nether shades, he dares not even guess, but dreads. For Jove not long before had seen her, while returning from her father's stream, and said, O virgin, worthy of immortal Jove, although some happy mortal's chosen bride, behold these shades of overhanging trees, and seek their cool recesses, while the sun is glowing in the height of middle skies. And as he spoke, he pointed out the groves. But should the dens of wild beasts frighten you, with safety you may enter the deep woods, conducted by a god, not with a god of small repute, but in the care of him who holds the heavenly scepter in his hand, and fulminates the trackless thunderbolts. Forsake me not! For while he spoke, she fled, and swiftly left behind the pasture fields of Lerna, and Lerkia's arbors, where the trees are planted thickly. But the god called forth a heavy shadow which involved the wide, extended earth, and stopped her flight and ravished in that cloud her chastity.
Meanwhile, the goddess Juno, gazing down on Earth's expanse with wonder, saw the clouds as dark as night enfold those middle fields while day was bright above. She was convinced the clouds were none composed of river mist nor raised from marshy fens. Suspicious now from oft-detected amours of her spouse, she glanced around to find her absent lord, and quite convinced that he was far from heaven, she thus exclaimed, This cloud deceives my mind, or Jove has wronged me. From the dome of heaven she glided down and stood upon the earth and bade the clouds recede. But Jove had known the coming of his queen. He had transformed the lovely Io, so that she appeared a milk-white heifer, formed so beautiful and fair that envious Juno gazed upon her. She queried, Who's? What herd? What pasture fields? As if she guessed no knowledge of the truth, and Jupiter false-hearted said the cow was earth-begotten, for he feared his queen might make inquiry of the owner's name. Juno implored the heifer as a gift. What then was left the father of the gods? T'would be a cruel thing to sacrifice his own beloved to a rival's wrath. Although refusal must imply his guilt, the shame and love of her almost prevailed. But if a present of such little worth were now denied the sharer of his couch, the partner of his birth, t'would prove indeed the earth-born heifer other than she seemed, and so he gave his mistress up to her. Juno, regardful of Jove's cunning art, lest he might change her to her human form, gave the unhappy heifer to the charge of Argus, Aristorides, whose head was circled with a hundred glowing eyes, of which but two did slumber in their turn whilst the others kept on watch and guard. Whichever way he stood, his gaze was fixed on Io. Even if he turned away, his watchful eyes on Io still remained. He let her feed by day, but when the sun was under the deep world, he shut her up and tied a rope around her tender neck. She fed upon green leaves and bitter herbs, and on the cold ground slept, too often bare. She could not rest upon a cushioned couch. She drank the troubled waters. Hoping aid, she tried to stretch, imploring arms to Argus, but all in vain, for now no arms remained. The sound of bellowing was all she heard, and she was frightened with her proper voice. Where former days she loved to roam and sport, she wandered by the banks of Anacus. There, imaged in the stream, she saw her horns, and, startled, turned and fled. And Anacus and all her sister Naiads knew her not, although she followed them, they knew her not, although she suffered them to touch her sides and praise her. When the ancient Anacus gathered sweet herbs and offered them to her, she licked his hands kissing her father's palms. Nor could she more restrain her falling tears. If only words as well as tears would flow, she might implore his aid and tell her name and all her sad misfortune. But instead, she traced in dust the letters of her name with cloven hoof, and thus her sad estate was known. Ah, uh, wretched me, her father cried, and as he clung around her horns and neck, repeated while she groaned, Ah, uh, wretched me, are you my daughter, sought in every clime? When lost I could not grieve for you as now that you are found. Your sighs instead of words heave up from your deep breast, your longings give me answer. I prepared the nuptial torch and bridal chamber in my ignorance, since my first hope was for a son-in-law, and then I dreamed of children from the match. But now the herd may furnish you a mate, and all your issue of the herd must be. Oh, that a righteous death would end my grief! It is a dreadful thing to be a god! Behold, the lethal gate of death is shut against me, and my growing grief must last throughout eternity." While thus he moaned, came starry Argus there, and Io bore from her lamenting father. Thence he led his charge to other pastures, and removed from her, upon a lofty mountain sat, whence he could always watch her, undisturbed. 
The sovereign god could no longer endure to witness Io's woes. He called his son, whom Maya, brightest of the Pleiades, brought forth, and bade him slay the star-eyed guard, Argus. He seized his sleep-compelling wand and fastened waving wings on his swift feet and deftly fixed his brimmed hat on his head. Lo, Mercury, the favored son of Jove, descending to the earth from heaven's plains, put off his cap and wings, though still retained his wand, with which he drove through pathless wild some stray she-goats, and as a shepherd fared piping on oaten reeds melodious tunes. Argus, delighted with the charming sound of this new art, began, Whoever you are, sit with me on this stone beneath the trees in cooling shade, while browse the tended flock abundant herbs, for you can see the shade is fit for shepherds. Wherefore Mercury sat down beside the keeper and conversed of various things, passing the laggard hours. Then soothly piped he on the joined reeds to lull those ever watchful eyes asleep. But Argus strove his languor to subdue, and though some drowsy eyes might slumber, still were some that vigil kept. Again he spoke, for the pipes were yet a recent art. I pray you tell what chance discovered these. To him the god, a famous naiad dwelt among the Hamadryads on the cold Arcadian summit, Nonacris, whose name was Syrinx. Often she escaped the gods, that wandering in the grove of sylvan shades, and often fled from satyrs that pursued. Vowing virginity, in all pursuits she strove to emulate Diana's ways. And as that graceful goddess wears her robe, so Syrinx girded hers, that one might well believe Diana there. Even though her bow were made of horn, Diana's rod of gold, that might she well deceive. Now chanced it Pan, whose head was girt with prickly pines, espied the nymph returning from the Lycian hill, and these words uttered he. But Mercury refrained from further speech, and Pan's appeal remains untold. But if he had told it all, the tale of Syrinx would have followed thus. But she despised the prayers of Pan, and fled through pathless wilds until she had arrived the placid laid on sandy stream, whose waves prevented her escape. There she implored her sister nymphs to change her form, and Pan, believing he had caught her, held instead some marsh reeds for the body of the nymph. And while he sighed, the moving winds began to utter plaintive music in the reeds, so sweet and voice-like that poor Pan exclaimed, Forever this discovery shall remain a sweet communion binding you to me. And this explains why reeds of different length, when joined together by cementing wax, derive the name of Syrinx from the maid. Such words the bright god Mercury would say, but now perceiving Argus's eyes were dimmed in languorous doze, he hushed his voice and touched the drooping eyelids with his magic wand, compelling slumber. Then, without delay, he struck the sleeper with his crescent sword, where neck and head unite, and hurled his head, blood dripping, down the rocks and rugged cliff. Low lies Argus, dark is the light of all his hundred eyes, his many-orbed lights extinguished in the universal gloom that night surrounds. But Saturn's daughter spread their glister on the feathers of her bird, emblazoning its tail with starry gems. Juno made haste, inflamed with towering rage, to vent her wrath on Io, and she raised in thought and vision of the Grecian girl in dreadful fury. Stings invisible and pitiless she planted in her breast and drove her wandering throughout the globe. The utmost limit of her labored way, O oh, Nile, you did remain, which, having reached and placed her tired knees on that river's edge, she laid her there, and as she raised her neck, looked upward to the stars, and groaned and wept mournfully bellowed, trying thus to plead, by all the means she had, that Jupiter might end her miseries. 
Repentant Jove embraced his consort and entreated her to end the punishment. Fear not, he said, for she shall trouble you no more. He spoke and called on bitter sticks to hear his oath. And now Imperial Juno, pacified, permitted Io to resume her form. At once the hair fell from her snowy sides, the horns absorbed, her dilate orbs decreased, the opening of her jaws contracted, hands appeared and shoulders, and each transformed hoof became five nails, and every mark or form that gave the semblance of a heifer changed. Except her fair white skin and the glad, nymph was raised erect and stood upon her feet, but long the very thought of speech that she might bellow as a heifer filled her mind with terror, till the words so long forgot for some sufficient cause were tried once more. And since that time the linen-wearing throng of Egypt have adored her as a god, for they believe the seeds of Jove prevailed, and when her time was due she bore to him a son called Epiphus, who also dwells in temples with his mother in that land. Now Phaethon, whose father was the son, was equal to his rival Epaphus in mind and years, and he was glad to boast of wonders, nor would yield to Epaphus for pride of Phoebus, his reputed sire. Unable to endure it, Io's son thus mocked him. Poor, demented fellow, what will you not credit if your mother speaks? You are so puffed up with the fond conceit of your imagined sire, the lord of day. Shame crimsoned in his cheeks, but Phaethon, withholding rage, reported all the taunts of Epiphus to Clymene, his mother. It will grieve you, mother. I, the bold and free, was silent, and if shames me to report this dark reproach, remain unchallenged. Oh, if I am born of a race divine, give proof of that illustrious descent and claim my right to heaven. Around his mother's neck he drew his arms, and by the head of Merops, and by his own, and by the nuptial torch of his beloved sisters, he implored for some true token of his origin. If moved by Phaethon's importuned words, or by the grievous charge, who might declare? She raised her arms to heaven, and gazing full upon the broad sun, said, I swear to you by yonder orb, so radiant and bright, which both beholds and hears us while we speak, that you are his begotten son. You are the child of that great light which sways the world, and if I have not spoken what is true, let not my eyes behold his countenance, and let this fatal moment be the last that I shall look upon the light of day. Nor will it weary you, my son, to reach your father's dwelling, for the very place where he appears at dawn is near our land. Go, if it please you, and the very truth learn from your father. Instantly sprang forth exultant Phaethon, overjoyed with words so welcome, he imagined he could leap and touch the skies. And so he passed his land of Ethiopia and the Indies, hot beneath the tawny sun, and there he turned his footsteps to his father's land of dawn. Oh, nerds, 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 how fun is this book? I know, I know. I talk about it, uh, how much I love this book so much, but it's just super true. The first half of book one can be a little dry, but this second half? Oh my god, finally, we're into the really juicy stuff. The myths you know, some that you don't. All of them involving trauma for women, good times, and all versions as interpreted by this Roman poet. A Roman poet who's writing his own spin on Greek traditions, on transformations. Obviously, the purpose of this work is to look at transformations, usually human or divine, and, and how they fit in with wider mythologies. Just remember, Ovid wasn't writing this to record Greek traditional stories. It isn't like the oral storytelling I'm always harping on. This was Ovid writing a work of poetry based on mythology. He wasn't even recording Roman traditions, to be clear. Like, this is poetry based on mythology. He wrote it in a book. 
It doesn't make it any less beautiful, but it is important context when you're trying to understand how his version of things fits in with the wider traditions, the stories more broadly. Consider this more fiction based on mythology. Plus, it's just interesting, you know? And he was writing at the same time as Virgil was writing the Aeneid. Like, both were ostensibly writing their works to honor Augustus. But Ovid was eventually exiled by that same Augustus. So who's to say how he really felt? Still, that's the timeline. And next time, Ovid tells us this full story of Phaethon that he just started hinting at at the end of book one. Along with some of the more uh, considerably tragic and traumatic uh, god-human relationships. <laughs> Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Leah Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things. She's the best. I couldn't do it without her at this point. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. She, too, is invaluable. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Oh, it's just so fun, you know? Oh, I am Liv, and I love this shit. Mm-hmm.